uh, so you probably don't want to miss that. Um, we're going to talk about processing IoT sensor data with InfluxDB, and actually, um, it can be IoT sensor data, but it can be any data. Uh, so you can also use it in a normal like enterprise application, as I will show you in a minute. Uh, it can be used, for instance, to store uh, exceptions or how long methods take and, and all kinds of information. Uh, so my name is Johan Janssen. Um, if you have any questions, you can also mail them or tweet them or just ask them uh, during the presentation or after the presentation, whatever you want. Um, so today, this is basically what I'm going to talk about. Uh, and I'm going to do a few demos or show at least how the code looks for a few solutions with InfluxDB by using InfluxDB Java, the Spring Data InfluxDB, and a solution with REST. So is this a marketing page for InfluxDB? No, it isn't. Um, I don't work for any of the companies related to the software I'm demoing, and basically feel free to replace uh, anything you want. Uh, this is just an example that I created uh, with some software that I like to use. Uh, again, if you have any questions, feel free to ask them immediately, uh, and I'll try to answer them immediately. So why did I start with this? Um, one good reason was I like to experiment with new stuff and I never tried time series databases and things like that. I did a lot with automating Lego trains with Raspberry Pis and other things with Raspberry Pis. Uh, so I like playing around with hardware. So um, this was basically a new project and it had another good reason. I have a garden where I basically I harvest uh, vegetables and I wanted to increase um, uh, how much I could harvest basically uh, for my vegetables, uh, but also for fruits, flowers and everything. Next to that, I have a basement um, with just a few less bottles than here. I drank the rest. Um, and of course, if I want to measure like the humidity in a room like this or how my flowers are doing or how much rain they get, I can buy stuff off the shelf. Like this is a machine to control the humidity. You can buy some weather stations in various forms. Um, but it's more difficult because it's hard to get the information out of it. Uh, I mean, I want to have like historical information, maybe even make predictions. Um, and so it is hard to use something off the shelf and it, yeah, you have to find something that can measure everything you want. Uh, because yeah, basically what do you want to measure? Um, not these kinds of things. But for instance, I wanted to measure like how much sun was there in the last couple of days or how dry is uh, the soil by now or how much rain was there. And, What's the quality of the soil? And I even want to measure that in different parts of the garden because like s vegetables, they have other requirements than for instance, flowers and even different flowers have different requirements. Some like water, some don't like uh, water. So I want to measure it uh, around the entire garden. By now you're probably like, what do I end up in? Is this a session about flowers and gardens? Um, don't worry, this was uh, the garden part. So we're going to dive into some technology stuff now. Um, so to do this, I ba basically I created a setup with a Raspberry Pi. And the Raspberry Pi you can see here, um, it connects to a sensor. This is the BME280 sensor. And it's connected to the GPIO ports of the Raspberry Pi. There is another sensor inside the Raspberry Pi to measure the temperature of the Raspberry Pi, which I will use. And the other two, those are basically uh, Bluetooth sensors, which you can buy off the shelf. And the one at the top, you can use it, for instance, to measure how the soil is and how your flowers are. It's specifically for flowers and plants, basically. Um, and so, yeah, nowadays you have a lot of Raspberry Pis. Which one should you pick? There are uh, quite some differences between them. All have different features. Some are bigger, some are smaller. Some have uh, Ethernet uh, connections, some don't. Uh, some are more expensive than others. And one thing that can be interesting, especially if you want to run them uh, on a battery instead of on like a power outlet, is the power consumption because there's quite a big difference in it. Uh, here you see some numbers for some of them and it, you can see that like the zero uh, W consumes like one third of the power of a 3B plus. Um, of course, it's also less powerful, uh, but if you don't need the power, uh, then I can advise to use like a zero W. I'm using the 3B plus because I also use, uh, use it to run Docker with my database and everything on it. And then it's better if you have a few more cores and the zero W doesn't have that. Um, so how does the setup look like? I have a spring application basically, and the spring application connects to the Raspberry Pi and retrieves all the sensor data. And it does that for these sensors. So I have two Xiaomi 
sensors. Officially, you have to connect them to like a hub with a Zigbee protocol, and then you can connect to the hub and everything. But the hub needs an active internet connection, I believe, and I don't trust people uh, that want me to use active internet connections. And I found out that you could also connect directly with Bluetooth to those sensors. But it differs. So some Xiaomi sensors you can connect to with Bluetooth directly. Others, you have to use Zigbee and a gateway to connect to them. So what am I measuring? This is basically a list of the different things I'm measuring. So I'm measuring temperature but with three different sensors. And things like moisture is only measured by the flora sensor. So I'm measuring all kinds of stuff. Then where we will we build the application? So again, I'm using a Spring Boot application. I could build it on my Raspberry Pi, but that's a bit slow. So in the end, I ended up building it on my laptop and then basically deploying it on my Raspberry Pi and starting it on my Raspberry Pi. Uh, because that, in the end, was a lot quicker. Um, I mean, laptops are still quicker than Raspberry Pis. Maybe in the future they will catch up, but not for now. Um, then how does the rest of the setup look like? Uh, so I have a Spring application at the top, and the Spring application will basically retrieve the data from the sensors, and then it will send the data to the InfluxDB database. And in the end, I will create a graph which will retrieve the data from the InfluxDB uh, database and show some nice graphs of it. Uh, I run everything with, or not everything, I run InfluxDB and the graphs, the, in my case, Chronograph uh, and Grafana. I run it in Docker containers with Docker Compose so I can easily start it up, but you could also install it manually without Docker. I just like to use Docker, it's easy. So why would, I, would you use InfluxDB? So InfluxDB is a time series database. There are some alternatives for it, but when I came across this one, it looked quite nice, so I started playing around with this one. Um, but I could have used, of course, um, a more traditional way like a SQL Server database, an Oracle database, or MySQL database to store the same data. Um, but for me, it felt a bit like old-fashioned, th those databases, um, a bit like fishing with a spear, which I greatly admire if you can do that, but maybe it feels a bit like using a hammer to fix everything. Well, you can, of course, also use a specific tool to, for the job, like this. And for me, like having just a time series database to store time-based uh, data uh, feels like a nice fit instead of having like a big database that can do 100,000 of things, uh, but uh, I just need one of those things. So that's why I wanted to try out time series databases. And actually, they work, uh, or at least InfluxDB works quite easy. Um, you can again start a Docker container, which basically connects you to a CLI, command line interface, and then you can basically query the database. So maybe just put it next to it. Uh, let's see, where is my... Um, so is this readable from the back? Cool. So I can say show databases, and then I see the different databases. So I, I basically send data to uh, the database in three different ways, with a Java client based on REST and with a Spring template solution. So I store the data in three different uh, databases, basically. And then I can say, um, use database, for instance, Java client, sensor data. And now I'm basically using this database. And then I can do things like, for instance, show measurements to see uh, what I basically have inside my database measurements. And it shows me basically what I measured. So like ambient temperature, ambient pressure, etc. And I can easily retrieve the data by, for instance, saying select a star from ambient temperature. and I get back all the data. And now you can see it's basically mixed, so all three different sensors are basically showing their data here. I could also use a group by, by sensor, and then it's basically grouped by sensor, and if I scroll, there's a lot of data in here, so I hope that I don't miss it. Uh. Oh, there it is. So here, for instance, for the BME 280 sensor data, it shows all the data for that specific sensor. So the queries you've seen until now, if you've done something with SQL, it looks quite similar, and it's quite easy to use. Um, so the different measurements I, s I already showed them. I can also do show series. Um, 
on a specific database. And then what I get is um, basically not only what's measured, so not only like ambient temperature, but also for which sensor it's being measured. So I have ambient humidity, for instance, for the BME 280 and for the high growth sensor. So it will basically show all measurements uh, and that times the different sensors that I'm using to retrieve that measurement. Uh, I've shown this already. Um, uh, one thing, I mean, uh, let's copy this quickly and put it over here. So this is the timestamp. I don't know if how many of you find this really readable, but for me it's quite difficult to uh, understand. Um, so you can, oh, now I copied that, of course shouldn't do that. I use this one. And now I set the precision and I do a new select, and now I get the time back. It's not completely the right time, it's probably the time zone from home or something like that. Uh, but if you set your time zone correctly on your Raspberry Pi, it shows the correct time. And this is, of course, a lot more readable, at least for me, than uh, the numbers you saw before. So that's, I don't know why they didn't make it by default this way. It would have made more sense to me, but maybe it takes a little bit more time to process the data. Um, if I want to insert data in the database, I can do it basically in the same way. I can create a query. Again, it looks quite similar to using SQL. We have insert statements. So I can basically say insert uh, this information into the ambient temperature, um, and then I'm good to go. But in my case, I mean, I'm a Java developer, so I didn't want to basically insert and retrieve everything manually. I want to use Java for it, um, and therefore I use Spring Boot. Um, which is quite convenient, works quite easily, and they had a nice uh, wrapper around it. So we're going to look at the three different solutions uh, to basically send data to InfluxDB or retrieve data from InfluxDB. Uh, there are three main solutions. One is using REST, and you can use that from basically any language. If you're doing Python or C Sharp or whatever language, you can use the REST endpoint of InfluxDB to send the data to InfluxDB. Uh, then there is an InfluxDB Java client, which someone wrote, and you can use that to, a bit easier, as we will see in a second, uh, communicate with the database. There are client libraries for many languages, but not for all languages, so maybe you're stuck with REST or you have to create your own library. Then on top, basically, uh, of InfluxDB Java is a Spring Data InfluxDB. Uh, it's another client, it's based on this client, but it's even easier to use, as we will see in a second. So if you use Spring, I can recommend adding uh, the one at the top. If you don't use Spring, you could use this one, which is still quite usable. Um, so we will start with this one. And therefore, we configure a few things, like I have to configure where my InfluxDB is running, and I have to create a database inside it. And for whatever reason, if I created the database, I have to set it again, what the name of the database is, and then I'm basically good to go. I have, I have my configuration um, uh, ready. Um, of course, I could make it a bit nicer in Spring uh, by using add bean to wrap the configuration and to specify the properties in the application.properties or some other configuration file, so you can make it a little bit nicer. Then we, we use so-called points. So every measurement basically is a point. So if I measure the temperature with my sensor, with my BME 280 sensor, then that's one point. Um, and we store that point in this way. We say what we are measuring. We enter the current time, of course, because it's a time series database. And then uh, we can add all the information that we want to store. So in my case, I want to store the host, which basically is my Raspberry Pi. My idea was to have multiple Raspberry Pis across the garden and in my house and everything. So I wanted to distinguish between them. And every Raspberry Pi is connected to one or more sensors. So I also needed the sensor name. And in the end, I needed the value, like it's 29 degrees, or humidity is I don't know how many. And then I can say build, and a point is being created. So maybe you're now noticing like, hey, I see tags and fields. There is one big difference. So a tag is indexed, and a field is not indexed. So if you want to query on something, it's probably better to create a tag of it. If you don't want to query on a specific thing, then you don't need to index it, and you can create a field for it. Such as, for instance, the value, I don't query on values, uh, so it's a normal field, but I want to query on sensor names or host IP addresses, so I created tags for those values. 
Then basically we have uh, a few methods on the InfluxDB uh, client, and that's uh, write, uh, write a point, and I can also write a point with some extra stuff like specify the database and the retention policy. So I can specify the data is only being stored for like a month. Maybe if you have a lot of data that you're storing, but you're only interested in the latest data, uh, for the last month, then you can specify a retention policy so that it's automatically being removed after a certain period of time. Um, if you have like lots of uh, points that you want to store, and maybe you have a network connection in between it, then it can be useful to batch it. So that basically this is an optimization step. It batches a set of points together and will send them uh, in one time to the database instead of doing multiple queries to the database. So this is everything um, in, in normal InfluxDB with the InfluxDB client in Java. So this you can use in any uh, Java project that you're doing. Um, if you're using Spring, you can use the somewhat easier form, and that's the Spring Data InfluxDB. Therefore, we specify some properties in our application, not properties, things like uh, password and uh, which database we want to use, etc. And then we can basically auto-wire an InfluxDB template, which looks a bit like a REST template, a UDBC template, or any template that you've seen in uh, Spring. Uh, so this is a bit easier to set up and uh, a bit easier to use, because now we can say basically uh, create a database and then write, and we can write one point, or we can write a list of points immediately. So basically, that is using batching underwater. So this works probably the most convenient way. Uh, if, if you have Spring already, then I can highly recommend using this one. Um, however, there is another way. We can also use uh, REST, uh, because there is a REST endpoint available in InfluxDB. And then basically what we do is we create like a large string with all the information, and at the end uh, we post it to the URL, and then it's basically stored in the database. Um, works and of course if you have a language that doesn't have a client then this is the quickest solution but I like using a client better than doing all kinds of string concatenations and probably running into all kinds of problems doing those string concatenations so I would prefer uh, using a client but if you're not able to do that because you don't want to use any libraries or you're working in a different language that doesn't have a client then using REST is a perfect alternative. So until now, we've stored data, uh, which we retrieved from the sensors, and we stored it inside the database. We can also do it the other way around. So we can create queries, in this case for the InfluxDB template, so the Spring solution. So we can create a query and then retrieve the query result from the database. So now I get the data that I stored in the database, I retrieve it back, and then I can do processing on it or, or whatever I want. And it looks a bit like this. So we have a query result uh, with lots of arrays inside it and inf information inside it. Um, and there's one disadvantage uh, if you use this directly. So if I do this in a unit test, I would get something like this. So I have a query result and I retrieve the results, which is basically a list. I have to get like uh, value X from it and then I get the series and there I'm again getting uh, some value Y from it. Uh, so it's all kinds of numbers and stuff which you easily mix up or make mistakes with. So I don't really uh, like this solution. I mean, working with numbers, um, it, it doesn't feel like nicely object-oriented. Um, again, for this, there is a solution, luckily. Um, we can basically create like wrapper objects. It looks for me a little bit like creating entities in uh, JPA. Uh, so basically, for a measurement, we create a class and we specify all the values that are in uh, the measurement. And then basically we store the data that we retrieve from the database inside these uh, objects. And we do it this way. So again, we execute the query and then we create the, uh, a mapper. And the mapper uses the ambient temperature class, uh, which I've shown you here. So that one is being used to store the result in. And then uh, I still, of course, I have a list, so I have one index that I have to use, uh, but for the rest, I can simply use the getters uh, that are present on my objects. So this feels a bit nicer if you want to retrieve results. Um, for my project, I didn't use it, so I only store data in a database, but if you want to retrieve data, this is the way how you can do that. And so for a dashboard, so let's simply uh, show this uh, live. Oh. What happened there? 
Um, so basically, I have a Java application running, and this is basically printing uh, what it's doing. And it's basically running every, let's see, one second or something like that at the moment, or 30 seconds. And it's retrieving all the data and storing it in the database. And I print it just that I can quickly see if something goes wrong or not. Um, and then we can have a look at the data by simply going to the dashboard. So this is Chronograph dashboard. It's from the same vendor as InfluxDB. Uh, you can use Grafana as well, although I had a bit more trouble setting it up um, together with InfluxDB, but it is possible. So if you have another dashboard solution already in your company, you can use that as well. Uh, but I found this a bit easier to use. So oh wait, I, wait, while testing, I already created a dashboard. Let's simply throw that away and create a new one. Call it Riga again. Um, so we're adding some data, uh, such as, for instance, ambient temperature, and where's my scroll thingy now? And that's strange. It's quite an ah oh wait, I can scroll here. So I want to select all the, um, the temperatures that I uh, retrieved from the different sensors, and I want to group them by sensor because I'm interested in like a line from a one a sensor and then uh, see all the different lines for all the different sensors. So one thing you have to remember is uh, to put this on like five seconds or something like that, then it will refresh data automatically every five seconds, else you have to manually refresh, which is a bit annoying. Uh, simply say, okay, oh wait, I should have given it a nice name, of course. Uh, so this is temperature, temperature. So I can resize it, I can change colors, I, I can even change it into bars instead of graphs, and you can v completely change the visualization. Um, I can actually show that. So I can... Uh, pick whatever visualization I want, uh, I can change the colors, everything. So it's completely customizable, but this is doable for us. So I see the different temperatures of the different sensors. And one other thing, uh, so this is really like sensor related to show you that you can also use this in like a normal application, maybe like a business application that uses that doesn't use sensors, but just runs on the server. Um, I add an extra graph, and in this case, I want to see the method duration. And method duration basically measures how long it takes to retrieve the data from a sensor. So I could do that in a normal application as well, and for instance, measure how long it takes to do a database query, or how long it takes to um, contact some service from another party, or whatever. And I want to know the information from all my sensors, group by again. Uh, I want to know the duration, and uh, let's see, let's, uh, method duration. So here I can see exactly how long each um, sensor takes to retrieve the data. So you can see that um, I need to write a little bit of code to retrieve the data from my sensor, and then I can store uh, the information quite easily in InfluxDB, and then I'm done. I basically, I don't have to write any code anymore. I can just simply click a few values and create the graphs that I need and have a nice visualization for it, which also is, of course, really appealing to managers. Um, so as, as a programmer, you can nicely fiddle with sensors and uh, underwater with some Java. And in the end, it looks quite nice. If I had to design this myself, it would probably have looked horrible. Uh, so I'm lucky that somebody else did this. Uh, so you can see it's refreshed every, like, uh, few seconds, let's see if I can get some temperature up. So I'm basically holding my finger on the BME 280 sensor. I could, oh no, I pulled off the power cord. So that was the end of the demo. <laughs> um, so actually if I put my finger on it and didn't pull out the power cord, you could see that basically the temperature would uh, rise immediately. So changes are, are visible directly, or at least after like five seconds, and depending on how often 
you retrieve the sensor data. So if you only retrieve the sensor data like once an hour, of course you don't see any changes every five seconds. Um, so you have to f play a bit with it. You don't want to retrieve sensor data like once a second probably, because that gives you an overkill of information uh, that you need to store. So go back to slides as I just killed my demo. Um, so I've shown, shown you, for instance, how to create like the, the ambient temperature for different sensors. I could, of course, also create a graph which showed all the measurements of the BME 280 sensor. So the humidity, the temperature, and one more that I forgot. Uh, so you can put any information in that you want, um, which is quite convenient. Again, don't forget to uh, refresh it. Uh, so some challenges I had, basically I, I had one big challenge and that was um, uh, to use the BME 280 sensor, which is again, it's, it's uh, I can put it up now. So this little sensor is connected to the GPIO ports of my Raspberry Pi. And it was a really nice project for it, uh, Pi4j, um, that basically created an abstraction layer, which allowed me to use it with Java quite easily. Uh, unfortunately, uh, it wasn't maintained for quite a while. So basically it didn't work on new versions of Java. I wanted to run everything on Java 11, basically use the newest stuff, but there wasn't any support. Um, and the guy who maintained the application didn't respond for like a year or something like that. Um, uh, luckily, like after I finished everything, he started working again on it. So I'd, I hope by now there is some Java 11 support, but last time I checked it wasn't available yet. Um, so that sometimes is a bit of a pity. If you want to do everything in Java, it's quite hard because IoT world, it's not really like a Java world. Most of the stuff is written in Python or C or uh, C++ or some of those languages. Um, and there are a lot fewer solutions in Java. And if you find them, they're sometimes not really well maintained or there is just the code somewhere that you can copy paste. There is not like a library that you can use and it's being published in Maven Central. Um, so that, that can be hard. And then uh, sometimes, yeah, you could get it to work with a lot of effort, uh, but maybe it's easier to just not build a complete Java solution and use Java like as an integration layer and get your hands dirty on doing the rest of the part, uh, which I basically did. So for instance, for Bluetooth, there is a tool called GetTool, which is like a Linux command line tool to connect to Bluetooth devices. And I use GetTool to retrieve the data from my Bluetooth sensors and to then get that data into Java is uh, fairly simple. There are some different ways, uh, but the most lazy way is probably uh, to simply use a process um, and in the runtime you can say exact command. So basically I can execute any Linux command this way and it will be executed underwater and I can retrieve the results by using a scanner which retrieves the results from the process uh, in the input stream. Back the values that I need and I can even get uh, the, the errors that are being produced by GetTool by using a scanner again and then retrieving the error stream. So this way I can get both like the good results and the bad results. So yeah, I was done, right? Actually, I wasn't really done. I thought I was done, but every time when I run it for a longer period of time, so my short tests worked if I just ran it for like five minutes, worked perfectly. But after like half an hour, it always crashed. And I, I tried all kinds of things. I checked all kinds of things like memory usage, CPU usage, if my sensors were still working. I checked the output stream. I checked, I logged basically everything at one point in time. And, and still after like half an hour, it broke down, which is quite annoying because every time you change something, you need to wait for half an hour or it was even a bit longer, I think like 45 minutes. So it made debugging quite hard. I actually tried debugging, but couldn't find anything with it. Uh, um, so I, I didn't really know what was going on, um, and, I, and I still don't know exactly what is going on, but I managed to fix it, uh, basically, by destroying the process after 20 seconds. So if the process takes longer than 20 seconds, my Linux command, it will be destroyed. I think that for some reason, the gut tool that I'm using, or either the connection that I make to my Bluetooth sensor, uh, isn't working completely properly and ends up in an endless loop, or at least it takes a really long time to process. And then all my, the rest of my application basically hangs. Uh, and with this solution, it works. So it's a bit of a dirty fix, but it works for me. So it was a bit like a sour apple or 
lamb in this case. Um, so one other thing that I was like, hmm, it, it, it was quite strange. I don't know if you, so this is again my temperature graph. Any of you who noticed something strange in this graph? You don't see that the lines are quite far from each other? So I put the sensors next to each other in the same room, but some sensors gave a different temperature than other sensors, which basically, yeah, who's lying now? Um, and uh, apparently I found out, it depends a bit on what, with, what, so which kind of sensor you have, uh, the, it basically, some are better than other sensors. And maybe if you invest more money, you get better sensors, but the stuff I bought, it was all fairly cheap. So the sensors I use are like 10, 20 bucks each. So it's, it's fairly cheap sensors. Uh, and, and maybe if you buy a bit more uh, expensive ones, then you get better grades. Uh, but I heard that the BME 280 sensor that I use connected to the GPIO pins, that that's actually quite a good sensor. And you can get those for like, I think I bought them for like 20 euros, but I also found them later for like two or three euros. So those tend to be quite good. At least that's what I heard. I don't have any reference to measure against. Um, so if you want to buy a sensor, I can recommend one of those. Um, but for me, it wasn't important that they were completely correct. I basically wanted to see what the differences are. So if temperature is going up or down, if moisture is going up or down, or humidity is going up or down, that was the most important part for me, not the accuracy. Um, next to that, I also, um, so I lock the exceptions. I store them in the database. So every time I get an exception, um, then I will store it in the database, including like the timestamp and which sensor it was. And I can retrieve those data from the database this way. Uh, and I got this graph. And it's basically because sometimes my Bluetooth connection fails or something goes wrong with Bluetooth. And uh, then I get an exception back. Uh, for me, that wasn't really like a big case because I measure like every 30 seconds and I don't mind if I miss one every five minutes or something like that because I'm fine with that. Uh, I don't need so many measurements. Um, one thing you can also see from the graphs, uh, this is a graph of the response times. So the time it takes for a sensor to respond to my question to uh, return the data. And what you can see here is basically the two at the top are the Bluetooth sensors. And the two at the bottom that you cannot even see are like the BME 280 sensor and the internal sensor of the Raspberry Pi. Uh, especially, uh, I, you can see it in a second, so if we simply query the data from the database. So we select the mean duration. So this is again just a normal query that I can execute with the InfluxDB CLI and I will get the result or I could even query it from Java. And then I get this back as a result. So you can see clear differences between the two Bluetooth sensors already, but between the Bluetooth sensors and the BME 280 it's huge. And the Raspberry Pi internal one, yeah, that's basically instant uh, in less than two milliseconds. So some are really slow, some are like really fast. Uh, so which one should you pick? Um, for me, again, it didn't matter that much because I don't need a measurement like every second. I'm fine uh, if I have a bit less uh, measurements. So I do it like uh, every 30 seconds. If you need those measurements every second or you need to respond quickly because you have, uh, I don't know, a nuclear power plant or something like that, then of course you want to have a quicker sensor. Uh, but normally, I think in most cases, it, it would be perfectly fine to have a measurement like every 30 seconds, and uh, that works with all the sensors that I've shown you. So there's not, not really like a bad solution. So I had some challenges, but in the end, I was uh, quite satisfied uh, by it. I can live with a few exceptions. I can live with uh, sensors that take a little bit more time. Uh, of course, it depends a bit on your requirements. And, and I quite liked uh, working with, uh, with InfluxDB. Um, so to go to the conclusion, and then I will show also a little bit of code because we have some time left, I see. Um, I think InfluxDB works quite well. I've never worked with uh, like a time series database. I was used to working with things like MySQL, SQL Server. Um, but it was quite easy to get uh, working with it. And they actually have quite good documentation about it. Um, and you can quite easily uh, retrieve and store data. Uh, and working with the dashboards, it's, it's really nicely integrated. Uh, they even have some extra products where you can get like an SMS or like an app uh, if some sensor data goes too high. So there are lots of products around these two. Uh, this basically is the basis 
and there's more stuff around it. You can use it freely. I actually, now I think about it, don't know how they make their money, but I mean, it's free, so we don't complain about that. Um, so for me, it, it was a nice uh, adventure trying it out, and, and, and I actually could think about using this in an enterprise solution uh, for the simplicity, and it fulfills all the needs that, uh, that I have. Uh, so I could use it in the enterprise, for instance, to log meta durations or to log exceptions or to log when somebody uh, logged in or logged out or whatever, basically. Uh, because that's all, all data that has a timestamp and where the timestamp is really relevant. And typically that data uh, is suitable for time series databases. Um, the application, you can find it on my GitHub account. Before you start complaining that there is some duplicate code and stuff inside it, I know there are some bad practices in it, but I try to keep it like really simple so that's easy to understand for everybody. And you can just look at one class to see what's going on instead of having to look at all kinds of uh, extra classes. So let's have a quick look at how that looks like. And so for instance, for the Linux command, uh, oh, wait, I make it a little bit bigger because probably at the back it's harder to read now. In the, uh, the Linux command, uh, I basically, I specify the command and uh, so this is my normal command. So if you're used to Linux, you could do like an ls or I could even do like a Java command, Java min version or whatever, any command that I want and I can simply supply it and then I can say okay, execute the command that I have and after like 20 seconds if the command didn't finish I will simply uh, kill the command and I will retrieve the result so I retrieve from the scanner the result and the result is returned to the calling class and uh, if we look at some of the different solutions so this is Bluetooth so for the GOT tool, I execute GOT tool minus B, then I need to supply the Bluetooth address, so every Bluetooth device has their own address, and I supply some arguments to it, and then I get some data back, and I filter that data, and I convert it to some result that I can easily read. So that's the solution that I'm using uh, for Bluetooth. For the BME280 sensor, like I told you, I'm using Pi4J, and Pi4J has some classes and stuff, uh, that we can use, but still quite some configuration. I tried finding this in a nice library, couldn't find it, so in the end I simply copy-paste it. It was open source, so I could use it. And basically what it does is it retrieves the data and then it converts it to the right number. So for instance, for temperature, for pressure, etc., it needs to do some conversions. So if you're lucky, your sensor g gives you back the data in a nice format. If you're unlucky, you need to do some conversions and then you have the data that you need. And then in the end, um, I store the data. So for instance, here I store it uh, with a REST template. And you can see here it's quite ugly. So I have to do a lot of string concatenations to get all my data together. And then I can finally post it. Uh, so I wouldn't recommend it unless you cannot use uh, one of the other solutions. Uh, let's see, I think this is, yeah, this is the, the Spring InfluxDB template. So here I can simply uh, create a few different points, like a temperature point, a battery level point, a lux point, etc. And it's, at the end I create a list of it, and I can write the list at once to InfluxDB template. So actually it's, it's not that, that much code that you need. Um, it's fairly simple to get going, and in the end I simply created a scheduler that would schedule uh, the retrieval of the data and the sending of the data every several seconds, and then you're good to go. So, that was it. Any questions? Yes, I can, of course. You're welcome. <laughs> Any other questions? Yeah, and if you have a question, uh, raise your hand. I'll bring you the mic. <laughs> okay, then I would say thank you all for joining and have a great lunch. And uh, yeah. then there's one last thing uh, that I need to tell you. The organizers would like to remind you that.